Um, well, my name is Matt Wild. Uh, I'm from Massachusetts originally, uh, born and raised till I was 11 years old. I moved to Virginia um, with my family and I started playing music when I was really young mm -hmm. up in Massachusetts with my, my mother got me a drum set uh, when I was very young. I actually have a picture of me when I was at, like nine months old find like a toy Sesame Street drum set. So wow. it's kind of always been in my, my realm. Um, I didn't really start taking it seriously till I was like in eighth grade. Um, I met some friends that were in a band and it was like, oh, this is something. Like I did dabble with it, whatever, but I didn't really take it seriously. But then I was just like, well, I could be in a band, you know, if I got a drum set. So I kind of coerced my mom into getting me a kit. Um, that I, I later paid, paid her back for it, but she did front the whole thing to me mm -hmm. and get me going. Uh, it was a Pearl Forum kit and I loved it very much. I started taking drum lessons, started taking it seriously, uh, as serious as I could with a kid with ADHD that could not focus at all. Um, and I didn't really, like we were in, I was in like little, some high school bands, but I really wouldn't like, I made art for him on my little Photoshop, my Corel Draw at the time growing up because I was born in 85, so mm -hmm. I'm 39. Um, so eighth grade was like, geez, I don't even know what year that was. <laughs> um, it doesn't matter. Um, so like, it really wasn't until I moved to Richmond that I was like, really gonna take a band seriously. And that was like in 2007. Mm -hmm. um, I moved in with the same people that I was started to play music with in high school. Um, uh, at least the first group, because I played with a, a bunch of different people and then ended up back with the first couple cats that I was playing with. They w hit me up. We were really good friends too. And um, they hit me up and was like, hey, we need a roommate and a drummer. And I was like, okay, wow. cool. That sounds great. Um, I was in a like a dead end spot in life at the time. Uh, drinking a whole lot, working at a Burlington Co. factory and really didn't have any much ambition. Uh, I still played drums. I had a drum set in the basement of that place. Um, but the, I remember the roommate there being just like really controlling and trying to put me in a box of mm -hmm. just like, you need to be this type of drummer and we just weren't working out together. Um, and that's, that's totally fine. Um, so yeah, I ended up uh, moving to Richmond in 07, uh, around August 07. And um, we, uh, a few months later, started a band called Hell Bear. And that was like my first serious band in Richmond. And we were a band for quite a few years after that. Wow. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. It was like thrash metal. Uh, and we all sang, screamed, whatever you want to call it. Wow. What about um, genre wise? Like how did, you know, how did you find the genre that you wanted to really be in? Or what's the primary genre that you like to play? So if you believe in genres. <laughs> Well, I guess they have to be there in order to differentiate moods, mm -hmm. um, contrast, and I am very, like, genre fluid, mm -hmm. <laughs> if you want to call it that. Um, I really like all different types of genres. I like blending them together. I like exploring new ones. I like to, I mean, there's, there's some that I just don't really have a whole lot of interest in, mm -hmm. but, like... Um, I feel like I like to play heavier stuff when I'm playing drums. Mm -hmm. um, I also made a bunch of music electronically in high school. I forgot to mention that too. Mm -hmm. So electronic music was also a background of mine that I liked a whole lot. Uh, my mother, like as a child, got me into classic rock and metal, mm -hmm. like Black Sabbath, I would say would be like the hardest, one of the harder things, Scorpions. Mm -hmm. um, like early rock and roll. My dad wasn't really into the heavy stuff. Um, he wasn't around as much. Uh, he ended up going to prison when I was like 17 um, for a very long time. So it was mostly my mom was like my influence for music. And yeah, so that like got me into, when I play drums, it was like rock drums, like rock mm -hmm. and roll. Um, instead of like, you know, Americana or country or pop or 
gospel or jazz. I had some jazz influence for sure. Uh, there's a lot of like old jazz um, in, uh, uh, artists that I'm really fond of that I took a lot of inspiration from. Mm -hmm. um, but it was it took me a long time to get into metal. So that wasn't even my background. Mm -hmm. Soul, I'd say R and B and rock and roll were like more of my backgrounds before I even got into extreme heavier type of music. Mm -hmm. I was a late bloomer on that. Okay. Yeah. Um, I feel like that leads me into where you are right now. How did Pyramid Mass come about? Like how did you guys band together? What's the history and the background of you guys? So Nick Kreider, the guitarist, and myself started the band. Um, Nick, I met Nick through, I want to say through Gallery 5, which is a local venue in Richmond. Um, they are a nonprofit organization. Uh, uh, no, they're a gallery, they're a venue, they have a small bar. Um, because they are a nonprofit, they can have the bar without serving the food. Uh, which is tight and they're like an art space um, They uh, Nick was the curator of that place. He was like the event coordinator. He's basically he ran the whole place mm -hmm. for like four years if not more and while he was doing that he um, Was in a band called dumbwaiter and he, dumbwaiter still exists um, That is like a bunch of my friends one of them Two of them are from Culpepper. So I went to high school with one of them. Mm -hmm. The other one was a couple grades above me. Mm -hmm. Still went to the same school, but like um, I dated his little sister when I was in like uh, 10th grade. So that's how I got to meet him. And he got me into metal. Mm -hmm. And he got me into uh, like a lot more intense music. So then flash forward, we moved to Rich, Richmond and I start meeting people. I'm like, oh, there, his name's Nathaniel, the drummer who got me into the metal. And I was like, oh, Nathaniel. And then the, and then my friends, uh, Keith was the, is the bassist. Mm -hmm. They started a band called Dumbwaiter with another friend of mine named Tristan, who's the saxophonist and Nick Kreider's the guitarist. So that's how I met Nick through this like assembly of all these musicians in this suite um, instrumental jazz rock band called Dumbwaiter. And so my band at the time, Hellbear, fell apart for the second, maybe third time. We were a mess. <laughs> um, and I was in, um, I was in a bunch of other projects too, but trying to get back to Pyramid Mass, Nick and I created a band called Doubtfire. Um, which was the name I gave it. And then a week later, Robin Williams committed suicide. And I was like, oh, we should probably keep this name. That's incredible. And I wanted to pay homage to that. Um, and then our first show as a two piece was in this like, um, communal living space that I lived in for like a decade mm -hmm. called the compound. And we had lots of shows and all kinds of stuff there. So we had our first show there. And it was just Nick and I as a guitarist and drummer. And I don't even think we had any vocals. We just was instrumental. And they were like the response from the audience. Cause there was a lot of musicians in the crowd, some friends and stuff. Mm -hmm. Like you need a bass player. And our friend Joey was there and he's like, I'll play bass. And we're like, okay. And so we, that's how we got our bass player. Um, Joey Anderson from night idea, um, Nick Ryder from, Dumbwaiter and then myself, we all got together and we were Doubtfire for like six years. Maybe, I think six years or something like that. And then I, it was the name that cursed us. Nobody wanted to take us seriously because it was just like, they would think of the movie, Mrs. Doubtfire. I don't know if you've seen it. Um, it's, a, it's a movie with Robin Williams and he like, it's he basically plays a father that loses custody of his children in order to get custody of him back. He, he, he dresses in drag as the nanny that the mother hires and undercover gets to see his kids as the nanny. And the mother doesn't catch on for a long time. <laughs> so it's pretty ridiculous. 
it's 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 amazing. It's an amazing movie. It's all over the place, um, but that's what everybody always thought of when they th saw Doubtfire. The movie's called Mrs. Doubtfire, but just Doubtfire. There's really no other context where that name is like kind of put into play. Mm -hmm. So I guess nobody ever really took it seriously, and it was it was like literally as soon as we we decided to rebrand last year. Last year. Yeah, the beginning of last year, we decided to rebrand, and we dropped our full-length monolith. Um, we had an EP, let's see, it was two years ago, I'm sorry, it was two years ago at the beginning of this month that we rebranded, because mm -hmm. I saw a Facebook reminder, that's what <laughs> it was. It was November 11th, two years ago, so 2022, we rebranded. We took our the the EP that we had just dropped on 2020. We're like that one's coming with us as Pyramid Madness, and then we dropped the next year 2023. We dropped Monolith in February 28th, February? January 28th, and it took off. Like we got a huge response from the internet. You know, we're not famous or anything, but like we definitely got more of a response from it than Doubtfire ever did. That's and really cool. that's kind of, yeah, that's kind of how it came together. Um, about Pyramid Mass, really, how many others do you guys have and like, what kind of instruments do you incorporate? So when we were Doubtfire, we had one extra one. We added a friend of mine, John Hawkins, a friend of all of ours, John Hawkins. He played guitar in a band called Navi, and he plays in a band called Oppen. He has his own solo thing called Thumper now. But he was like a modular synth, so he would have like just these synthesizers and just be like twisting knobs mm -hmm. and plugging wires and just making all this crazy chaos noise over top of our chaos. And that was really fun, but we got really busy. We didn't also weren't as active, so we split ways. So we went back down to a three piece and then rebranded. Mm -hmm. So it's always been Nick, Joey, and I. Mm -hmm. And so Nick plays guitar, and he does more vocals than ever before now. Mm -hmm. um, but he didn't on the first couple recordings. And then Joey, he plays bass and does vocals. Mm -hmm. He's like my backup singer. He does, he pulls the weight off of me, because I play drums and I do the lead vocals. And when I can't, when I have things I write that I want to be done vocally and I can't perform them because I'm doing whatever on drums and it's too much, I'm like, Joey, can you do this here? And then that's kind of how we work it out. Okay. You mentioned you got a really good response from like the internet when like releasing Monolith. How has the response been like overall Richmond City? Like having performances in Richmond, what does the music seem like to you really? How would you describe it? So when we first dropped it, it was not, Richmond didn't take it as, as, as well as the rest of the world, I would mm -hmm. say. Um, it's not that type of, I feel like our genre doesn't hit Richmond as hard as it does other places. Um, Richmond has more of like a hardcore, we w I wouldn't really describe our band as hardcore music. Um, it's more like avant-garde metal is what it's been described as. It's mm -hmm. more experimental, black metal, grindcore at times. Um, but as far as like hardcore with breakdowns and payoffs, that's not as much as us. It's like we kind of used to be like that with Doubt Fire, mm -hmm. but not so much anymore. So I feel like Excuse me, mm -hmm. bubbles. <laughs> um, I feel like, yeah, we didn't really have that much of a uh, crazy response. But like, then again, our album release for Monolith on January 28th at Gallery 5, there was over 80 people there. So that was a pretty good wow. response for our first show. We don't play a whole lot, so we try and keep it. We're all really busy too. So it's like a mixture of we're trying to keep it so we're not playing a lot so people will actually come to our shows instead mm -hmm. of just being like, oh, well, I'll probably see them next week. Because it's easy to overplay yourself in the mm -hmm. city. Um, 
so we, you know, we kind of hope for the best. Uh, our last couple shows have been well attended, so mm -hmm. I'd say we're, we're pretty lucky to have the turnouts that we have, okay. that we have had. Um, what initially drew you to, like you said, avant-garde metal? Is that how you phrase it? Yeah. Um, what initially drew you to this genre of music? Uh, I like anything but mainstream. Mm -hmm. So things that are like, I mean, you know, it's kind of typical to say that as a musician, it's like, oh, I'm not going to do things that other people have done. Mm -hmm. But it's like a whole sound of sound blending between Nick's wild, spacey guitar riffs, um, my drumming that is more guitar focused than it is bass focused mm -hmm. whereas a lot of drummers will go with whatever the bassist is doing and hold down rhythm section together I like to write with the guitarist mm -hmm. um, and with me doing vocals and well with all of us doing vocals it, it just kind of allows us to paint like a, a weirder picture we try and do, we try and write our music like not, we try and write our songs not like um, basic song structure where it's like verse, chorus, verse, bridge, mm -hmm. and all that. So, I don't know, I guess the, the weird spacey domain and like being able to contrast between like big, open, powerful sound to like fast and aggressive has been always a nice contrast. I've always felt comfortable with that. I really like that extreme fluctuation from one to the other. Mm -hmm. So that's that's been my draw to it. I, I feel like we all probably have our own reasons why we make the weird shit that we make. <laughs> How about what does like the creative process look like for you? You want to make a song? Where does it start? Especially like you said, you know, you're all vocals. Mm -hmm. How do you incorporate all of that? So it usually involves Nick and I. We get together without Joey, because Joey has kids and he's like, I mean, not to say he doesn't show up to practice by any means, he does, like we all get there. Um, but Nick and I end up writing a lot of the songs by ourselves mm -hmm. and then Joey will come in after the fact and be like what did you guys do or we'll send him a little phone recording mm -hmm. that we've done and he'll be he'll listen to it and come up with some ideas mm -hmm. and then he'll kind of fill in that space that we've like allowed for him while we're writing we'll be like oh well, well Joey will sound really good right here probably doing his thing because he's more of like a pocket bass player where he like he doesn't do like a lot of technical stuff on the bass He's like big and open and just like likes to colorize what Nick and I have done and like kind of give it substance without getting too all up in our, mm -hmm. you know, stepping on our on toes and stuff. And same thing, like vice versa. So I would say Nick and I write it first mm -hmm. and then Joey comes in. And then sometimes when Joey comes in, we can totally rewrite something mm -hmm. that's not always the case but that definitely has happened before where it's just like oh something he's got is really really good or he'll just have an idea where he wants to try and it just works so we just we don't fight anything we're really we don't talk a lot during practice it's just like we kind of let the music come out mm -hmm. and we play a bunch and we don't the thing that I really love about our practices is be, is that, and we're not like, but I want the guitars to sound like this and the bass to sound like this. Why don't you do this? It's just like, we just play and we trust each other mm -hmm. that it's gonna eventually sound really badass. <laughs> and then we just, we let it go. And then if we have things like after mulling over for a while, it sounds like, you know, usually it'll be like, Call it, we call him Jerry sometimes. Um, his name's Joey, and it's a weird thing. Um, so usually I almost just called him Jerry, and I'm like, I'm probably gonna have to explain that if I slip <laughs> up. So if if Joey's like, yo, I'm hearing this because he's bass, he wants to do something, I usually have to follow him, 
but most of my my drums are going to be written based off of whatever Nick's doing. Mm -hmm. But then sometimes Joey and I like to hold <laughs> something down mm -hmm. and let Nick just freak out and do something else. So then after we have figured out all of that stuff, I'll write lyrics to it. And I'll write all the lyrics to it. And then I'll have mine. And then I'll be like, all right, Joey, you sing these. Mm -hmm. And then Joey will sing the lyrics that I've written. And I have yet to write any lyrics for Nick because what Nick will do is wait until we record. And then he'll just get in and he'll just totally off the cuff do some something random. Mm -hmm. And it's usually like, it's either onomatopoeia, like just some like gargling, choking noises, just something that has no lyrical content or the last time we just recorded in August. So this time he had written some stuff down mm -hmm. and we laid those tracks down. And it was just like in the studio, Nick wrote his vocal parts pretty much the day before or whatever. Wow. And so we get all that new stuff recorded and then after the recording's done and we love it and it's going off to mastering, once we get back into the practice room, we're like, okay, now we got to make sure we nail all these added things that we put in in the studio live. Mm -hmm. So we do the recording justice. So sometimes we have to teach ourselves new parts after we've recorded it. Okay. Uh, you've said like you and Nick, you write the songs. Did I get the name? Yeah, right? pretty much. I mean, um, we all do, but Nick and I um, write the foundation, we'll yes. say. Um, what's what does that look like? Is that traditional music notation or how do you actually oh, no. write it all down? So Joey is a music instructor and he's more of like the, the, oh, we need to do this because music <laughs> theory. And we're like, okay, Nick and I are just totally like by feel, we're going to do whatever mm -hmm. feels great. Mm -hmm. And then Joey's going to come in and like throw some theory on it mm -hmm. and be like, I'm going to do this walking to up or down part because of this and then it sounds really cool and we're like all right yeah okay. that's pretty much what that looks like how do you capture the idea really uh it starts as whatever nick is going with so yeah it's like whatever riffs nick has written that's what starts the fire mm -hmm. and then we start i start kind of directing it and moving it around and then joey figures out how to balance the whole thing out. Okay. And you've talked about um, writing lyrics. What do you most like to write about? Do you have a specific topic or is it just different? So, I like to write about, I like to write about positivity, but I also like to write about destruction mm -hmm. and um, kind of like state of the world but then also like perspective and yeah, I didn't even think about trying to describe this. Um, so yeah, I like to be vague, but I also like to be able to, I don't like to spoon feed lyrics to anybody. Mm -hmm. I don't like to be like this and then this and then this because of this. Mm -hmm. I like to kind of paint a picture with words mm -hmm. so you can kind of extrapolate whatever you want out mm -hmm. of it or it means different things to different people, but kind of along the same path. Um, so like I guess I can give you some examples uh, for our first EP, Sputrid, um, uh, Bronze Bowl was about the old torture device that they used to use back in the day that was like a it was a bronze bowl and they would literally put somebody inside of it close it start a fire underneath and the, the mouth of the bowl was designed to change the screams into this howl and mm -hmm. i wrote a song about that mm -hmm. in kind of loose worded ways but then we i just titled it bronze bowl so that was the most direct song that i i've written so far for the the project mm -hmm. and then you know i've written a song about war um profits like capitalism like how 
corporations are super greedy and they just mm -hmm. don't care about anything and they'll just like do literally anything to get more money um and then also about um kind of spiritualism and using uh like a perspective twist like i'll paint a horrid picture at the beginning of the song and near the end of it i'll kind of illustrate how to flip that negativity into something positive mm -hmm. um if that makes sense yeah um and kind of coming back to the genre uh and it's like existence within richmond would you say you guys are like one of the few or maybe like the only band that really plays avant-garde um, and that um, does the kind of thing that you do because you you said that you're better received on the internet than yeah we definitely are um, I feel like we there are bands um, in Richmond that do and have like Inner Arma is a really good example of a band that we have yet to play with but I feel like we would fit really well within the same mm -hmm. style of music um they have an amazing sound of just like i don't know it's like it's progressive but there's a lot of other things in that as well um there's a lot going on with that band they've been mm -hmm. a band for a very long time so i feel like that would be a good example of a band that we would be um good with that's from richmond um i feel like there's not a whole lot of bands that are doing like what we're doing but I feel like there's definitely bands that are doing their thing that are like right alongside us um, there's another band that's coming out with a new one there we I don't want to say anything because I don't want to jinx it because when you don't have a show booked you just don't want to talk about it until it's all settled mm -hmm. and done um, there's we also like to play with different genres too. That's mm -hmm. a lot of fun. Like just to kind of keep it mixed because we like to kind of mix up things within our own sounds, but still remain in the metal genre. Mm -hmm. But like, as far as like playing with like, or like our album release it had like a hip hop artist opened it up for us, Black Lick. And it was amazing. It was super, super well received. He has a punk band that couldn't show, so he did his solo stuff and we were like, very excited and it went it was really good mm -hmm. um but yeah to answer your question like I'm, I'm not trying to say that like nobody's doing what we're doing because i'm sure there's people out there plus there's a lot of bands in richmond mm -hmm. it's really hard to keep up with all of the new ones um and especially like i work at a gallery so i get the opportunity to see a lot of acts that i wouldn't have seen otherwise mm -hmm. so i get the um the honor of doing that mm -hmm. um but yeah i don't know as far as exactly what we're doing probably not but close to what we're doing and along the same vein like yeah totally there's 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 plenty of bands that we can play alongside and and still have and have this similar effect Okay, I'm kind of interested, not knowing anything much about different music scenes in the U.S., how the switch to Richmond has maybe influenced your music path? Has it influenced it at all? Like, how would you compare the two music scenes from where you come from and to Richmond? Oh, yeah, most definitely. It wasn't nearly as, like, <laughs> I hate to say cool guy, but, like, it was... I learned a lot when I moved to Richmond. I learned how to... I mean, playing shows and just being in the music scene, you will learn a lot if you are observant and you take a lot in and you talk to other musicians and you try and get outside of yourself and mm -hmm. see how it's done around. Um, yeah, I it would like I played in shitty like metal projects and punk rock and roll stuff that I wasn't even really anywhere near as into as I am with the stuff that I'm playing now. I, I'd say I hadn't even really found what I was super passionate about when I was behind the drums. Like I love playing drums and I definitely had passionate moments playing with friends mm -hmm. and that's why I kept it up. 
and but like until, until I got to Richmond and realized like you can you can make it if like you like a lot of the stuff we did would be DIY because mm -hmm. like none of us had money to really throw at the things we were doing mm -hmm. so we would make our own t-shirts from scratch and show flyers and whatever we could to get it out and like show people like yo we're doing stuff we're trying to take it seriously um so i would say moving to richmond helped me realize how to build the foundation and and the things that you need to do to become a good band mm -hmm. not to say that we were doing them all uh we were doing a lot of them um but like I was heavy, heavy into drinking for many years from m moving into Richmond and de like over a decade later that got in the way of a lot of the, you know, the progress and the efficiency. And it could have been, could have been better, you know, but you know, that's what, that's what we learn from our mistakes. So. Yeah. Um, how do you see maybe um, the Richmond music scene expanding in the time that you've been here? Like, how has it changed over time? Do you feel like it's changed? Yeah, it's changed a lot. Um, you see house shows come and go. You see venues come and go. Um, and it's, and it, it really sculpts the, the face of, of the music scene because mm -hmm. it's like, where do we play? You know, what is that going to look like? What is it going to feel like? Who's going to be there? Is it going to be well promoted? Mm -hmm. Is it going to be a ghost town? Um, so like, you know, well, well run house shows, house venues, they take a while to grow and like be a substantial thing. The same thing with venues. Like, I mean, venues can come out of the woodwork and be like all super flashy and like ready to go. And, you know, and a lot of those venues do do well. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, you know, for me, it's like hard for me to like, I don't know. It's, uh, you know, I don't, maybe I don't like change, but like it's the, it's, it's hard to be like, you know, I miss Strange Matter. Strange Matter was a sh uh, venue that we had on uh, Gray Street mm -hmm. that was on the, I can't remember what, what the number of the block was, but um, it's right on campus, VCU campus, on like Harrison and Grace. And that was the old Nancy Reagan and the twist old twisters. Mm -hmm. And it was like a bunch of myriad of other things before that. So it was always kind of like this venue space mm -hmm. and people would know to go there. They would know to walk by it, to look at the flyers, to mm -hmm. see what was going on. And there even used to be back in the day a copy shop a uh, a print shop right mm -hmm. across the street so you could go there and print out your sh your show flyers and just go hang them up right it was all like super close mm -hmm. like almost too good to be true um so like strange matter's gone nothing has moved into that i shut down in like 2018. it's been forever you know there's been other plenty of other venues that have rose up nothing quite like that you know we got fuzzy cactus we got gallery five since we moved this stage has been incredible um as far as like picking up better shows uh sounding better um just being more of a like a feng shui type space um to where because they moved the stage from one end from the middle of the room to the side so mm -hmm. it just like opened up the middle floor and it just sounds so much better in there. Um, so that they have held it down. Um, I don't really know if, I mean, this might be just because I'm older, but I don't really know many uh, sh like house show venues mm -hmm. that are really doing it like like older ones were. Like mm -hmm. there, there used to be one in, um, there used to be like Old Venable Street in Church Hill. There was, um, oh, I'm blanking on the name of the other street. There was one named after Cedar Street, the Cedar House. Mm -hmm. um, I remember seeing shows there and then like Love Jail, um, The Yerb. The Yerb was in Jackson Ward and they had like a whole backyard and they had a stage on their first floor. It was like, they just, 
<laughs> dedicated the bottom of the house to shows. It was like, wow. I didn't even understand, couldn't understand how people would actually live there. Wow. Because it was rough. Um, but yeah, and behind the stage was the kitchen. <laughs> it was backstage. Oh <laughs> it was wild, yeah. <laughs> and then like the whole backyard was like nice and decked out with lights and everything. And they had it set up where it's like the fenced in so you could check IDs and then people would go in. Like there would a line would form outside. It was wild. Wow. Yeah, it was almost like it was made for it, but that doesn't exist anymore. Um, um, Crystal Palace was short-lived spot in Jackson Ward. But it's just like, yeah, like, when things change, it's like, okay, well, where do we play now? Mm -hmm. It's like, well, then everybody goes back to the actual venues. Like, mm -hmm. Bandito has just come a long way. From, they upgraded their sound, and they really treat their bands really well. So I'm excited to play there this Saturday. Um, it sounds good. We played there. Last time we played, I think we played there. Mm -hmm. um, and it sounded great, and it was a huge draw. They take care of their bands, they take care of the touring musicians. It's it's just a really good setup. Um, Broadberry usually takes touring packages that are coming through Richmond, and a lot of times those touring packages want guarantees, mm -hmm. and a lot of times they don't want local musicians on there. Mm -hmm. So you'll get places like the National, the Broadberry, uh, Richmond Music Hall, a show will come in, and you'll be like, hey, I only see you got two bands on that. Can we play that? And they'll be like, no, because there's a guarantee. Mm -hmm. The booking agent has a certain requirement, mm -hmm. yada, yada, yada. That's just how it is. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of weird. It feels like they have a monopoly on things. Mm -hmm. uh, the Camel has separated from the Broadberry. So it's been nice that they have kind of back to their the old format of just like letting local bands play. Um, but yeah, it's just been, I don't know, there's, there's so many factors in that. It's, a, it's a, kind of a loaded question. Um, so it's like, yeah, it has changed a lot. It's still thriving. It looks way different than it did when I first got here. Oh man, the Bone Zone. That was, <laughs> that was a crazy house show, or house show, um, house venue that would be as busy as like a normal venue in mm -hmm. Richmond. They'd have so many bands and like five people live there and they would just have shows in the basement all every night. It would, wow. it would seem, yeah, it was crazy. But that was, I mean, that was years that that existed, but that died out shortly after I moved here. And then that was, bef that was before Strange Matter. So it's like, yeah, it's been an ever evolving phase. I feel like there's less house venues because they always get busted. Cops come in and they bust and people complain, noise complaints and stuff like that. You get noise curfew at 11 o'clock and then all of a sudden you get cops knocking at your door. Mm -hmm. um, so I used to live in one too, the compound. It was a second story downtown and we'd have shows there all the time, but we had nowhere to really park. Mm -hmm. um, at night you could park but you couldn't stay you'd have to get out of there or move by 6 a.m or you were getting a big ticket mm -hmm. or a toad or a boot or maybe all of them um but our floors started getting really wonky and we couldn't have like a bunch of people in there the there was there was a shower that was leaking and it was rotted out the joists and so it got all squishy and we couldn't was, you know, we didn't want people getting hurt so we had to shut that down and that was years ago. Mm -hmm. That was that was before Strange Matter shut down. So yeah. I am always on the lookout, I feel like, for new house shows and new venues just to see what else is out there mm -hmm. and like what the next step could be. Cause like playing at a new venue is really exciting and anything to help the music scene thrive more. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, it definitely okay, does. Cool. Um, and I'm definitely interested in like the specific subculture of metal that you're really playing, the subgenre. Don't know how to name it. Um, but I'm really interested um, about your pull towards it. Like, what does this genre allow you that you feel like maybe other genres don't? Uh, Freedom of expression, I would say, would be the first thing. Because, I don't know, whatever the heck we're doing kind of comes um, 
I wouldn't want to say naturally, but it definitely, I have a pull towards mm -hmm. it. And when I do feel inspired, it is of that realm that I really like creating with. And especially, I feel so fortunate to be in a band with Nick and Joey. Sorry, because they are both extremely talented musicians and we all kind of have the same vision for what this project is. So we get excited at the same moments, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? And seeing their excitement excites me as mm -hmm. well too. Um, and that kind of helps fuel the fire. Um, if I was, if I was playing in like a tech metal band, I'd be bummed out because it would probably kick my ass with the, all the, the, I mean, I like to play fast, but then there's like playing fast for, you know, 30 solid minutes the whole time. Mm -hmm. And then like, yeah, that doesn't seem fun for me. Like it's, it's awesome to watch, but also I like that contrast, mm -hmm. I like to pull away and like kind of draw people in mm -hmm. and then hit them with something big. Mm -hmm. Like I feel like we can do that. Whereas like other bands can be like, thrash metal is just like hauling ass the whole time, mm -hmm. which is fun. That's what we did in Hellbear. And it was like a time and a place for that. Mm -hmm. So I got a chance to do that. After Hellbear broke up the first time, I joined a band called Cardinal Compass and that was Americana with a female singer songwriter mm -hmm. and it was like totally different. Mm -hmm. That's how I met Nat. Nat became uh, our second guitarist and backup singer and we were writing like country and pop and Americana. So it was like a challenge for me and I took it as a challenge so I could slow down mm -hmm. and like learn how to exercise uh, dynamics and figure out how to approach um, uh, music without just like hauling ass the whole time. So coming out of Hellbear and into going into Cardinal Compass was like a nice challenge for me. Um, plus I'd known Hannah, the, the front lady for that for, for years. And it was just like playing with friends. Mm -hmm. So that was cool. So I did that at the same time as starting a band with Keith who's the now bassist of Dumbwaiter, Keith and I started a two-piece called Promethean, and that was like progressive rock. So I was still able to do some like fast, busy type of drumming in that and have Cardinal Compass. And then I had a third thing, which was like also a singer songwriter called Love Bolts and Dynamite. Mm -hmm. And that was very short lived, cause, but that's how I met the saxophonist Tristan, who became the saxophonist and dumbwaiter, but we still, I stole him from Love Bolts and Dynamite and put him into, well, I, he, he chose to, he accepted the invitation, but uh, we, we got him into Promethean. So we had like this progressive rock with saxophone and it was like really cool and instrumental. It was, um, yeah, instrumental. And it was like, um, just like really exciting to have something that was like, very um, experimental and something that like we could do pretty much whatever Keith would write the guitar parts Tristan would write them the single note melodies with the, with the saxophone but he also had his sax run through an effect pedal like a guitar so it just sounded crazy and then we eventually got a bass player but then I feel like that was the precursor to Doubtfire which became Pyramid Mass because I was able to do some weird stuff and get kind of in the spacey realm. But then the dudes came back from New York. The dudes, I'm meaning Rob and Jared and Hellbear. And so we brought Hellbear back together again. And so when we did that, we ended up bringing an another member in um, and that took off again. So at that time, Hellbear was like kind of our shit and we were like really stoked it and I put all my effort into it. I stopped playing a card in a compass, Promethean, we stopped doing that. Keith started doing dirty banners and I started focusing on on Hell Hellbear until it just died. Mm -hmm. We just drank too much and argued too much and it was not a cohesive unit. 
we were able to get our shit together in order to cut. I'm sorry, I'm swearing. I don't know oh, if no, you can. Sorry. Okay. Uh, in order to get um, together for an album, so we were able, we recorded an album and put it on a vinyl, and it was the first time I had ever put my music on vinyl. And mm -hmm. It was super exciting. Mm -hmm. um, so like, we were able to get through that, but shortly after that it just yeah it just fell apart we had just gotten a new member it was like our second guitarist eric from the catalyst mm -hmm. and then it was like months after he joined it just tanked so we said screw this we're not doing this anymore um we disbanded and then um it was shortly after that we started doing doubtfire i think I've been in a bunch of projects. I don't know if I'm, <laughs> I'm forgetting one. Oh, Gorak. So Tristan and I also have this two-piece called Gorak that's just drums and saxophone. Mm -hmm. And we were able to record uh, our demo and put that out. And we keep talking, because I work with them at Gallery 5, we keep talking about, oh, when we're going to get back and do Gor Gorak again, we're going to do this and this and this and this whenever we do. And just haven't at all so it's just like one of those things one of those kind of like it seems like a pipe dream right mm -hmm. now but maybe once we get some spare time mm -hmm. the, each of us at the same time however that lines up um so gorak was another thing that we did for a little while that we got some draw but we didn't we didn't put nearly enough effort into it because he's super busy with dumb waiter and then i my baby is at the time, Doubtfire, but Pyramid Mass. And so Joey's in Night Idea, and they're very busy. They've been a band for years, longer than Dumbwaiter. And then Dumbwaiter is super busy. Mm -hmm. So like, and then, so I was in a band w with two members of Dumbwaiter, like two bands. Mm -hmm. So Nick with Pyramid Mass, and then Tristan with Gorak. And so whenever Dumbwaiter would do every, uh, anything, I would just be like, well, I guess I'm not playing music. <laughs> so that's when I started doing solo stuff and started learning how to, get, I started getting back into doing solo stuff and making my own music on the computer. Wow. So how's that been going? That solo stuff? That's been awesome. I really, if you're going to fall over. <laughs> um, so I just dropped my first full length um, album on the first of this month. Mm -hmm. I dropped an EP last year around my birthday, mm -hmm. or it was like in August, and then on my birthday I dropped a music video for one of the songs. And then I kind of just got busy with other things and then picked it back up. And I had been mulling over this full length, because it's like 12 songs. And I've been mulling over it for months, and then it just kind of, I had some conversations with some friends and was mm -hmm. just like, I gotta just drop this thing. I gotta just let it go into the atmosphere. Just gotta, gotta stop like nitpicking it. Cause like, it's a good way to ruin a song. It's just like overanalyzing it and like working it to death. And I was just like, you know, I'm just gonna do it. I had a, friend, a conversation with my friend, with Nathaniel, the drummer of Dumbwaiter. And he told me about this friend of his who he recorded some music with is like this guy r records all kinds of stuff mm -hmm. and he wrote recorded and released an uh, ep in one day and i was like what, what am i doing <laughs> you know i kind of like immediately was like th i thought of my stuff and how it's just like sitting there on the shelf waiting for it to go into the ether and i'm like i'm gonna save up some money and i'm gonna get it mastered and i'm gonna do all this and i'm just like man who am i kidding like let me just get it out there and before it just it rots and then like i can get more motivation because i've already started writing other stuff mm -hmm. so all of that stuff that i released is like it's like electron it's like house techno mm -hmm. um ambient uh nostalgic kind of could be used in a video game could be used in a tv show um it's all instrumental and um it's called Ghost in Human Shape, mm -hmm. which is my my Instagram handle. Um, the full length is called Floating Teeth, 
and the title track is is a noise set mm -hmm. of me opening and I took my phone and I put it in an old dishwasher uh yeah an old dishwasher and took the door and opened and closed it oh. and then I layered that the noise that it made was crazy there was so many noises going on I was like I I want to do some of that and then I put like crickets underneath of it and like this other like atmospheric noise to kind of tie it all in together to keep it simple and creepy and so I that's the title track and all the other ones are like actual composed songs mm -hmm. with like melodies and bass lines and drums and all this other stuff um, but yeah so I wrote released that it's 12 tracks and I was really excited about it I put it on Bandcamp um, the other stuff that I re released last year under the same name I put out I paid to put it out through Root Note, which puts it out on Spotify, Apple Music, iTunes, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And so this time I was like, we are dumping money into Pyramid Mass right now. So I'm like, I'm just going to put this on Bandcamp. Mm -hmm. Bandcamp's great because you can literally just, I record something on this today and put it on Bandcamp. Mm -hmm. Like it just allows you to do that and you can name your price and it allows you to just do that as much as you want it. So it makes it really easy because like with Root Note and Spotify, you have to wait like a month for it to show up and you don't even know exactly which day it's going to show up. Like they'll tell you, but it might not be that day. Mm -hmm. So you can put in a the only you can put in a release date and it will drop. Um, but uh, if you don't do that, like, I don't know, I've had some weird problems with it before. I'm mm -hmm. sure it's a lot easier than I'm making it out to be, <laughs> but like that's the kind of like the stuff I wanted to just get out of the way um and just go ahead and drop it mm -hmm. so I dropped that and I already started writing um more of like a hardcore thing it's like black metal mm -hmm. industrial black metal so it's just like super aggressive fast drum machines and I'm screaming in like five different layers on top of each other and just get it out there wow. so I haven't released any of that yet but I was working on I was literally working on some of that today but well, is there anything that I didn't ask you that would maybe help me understand you more understand the music you do more is there anything that you want to say that you haven't had a question to answer to oh um I don't know kind of just I feel like I've just been kind of rambling it's, it's really good for me to go off of questions that it's really helpful um I don't know I'm just like super blessed to be in this music scene um and now in a sober state too I quit drinking two, two years ago and it feels like now I can actually remember the shows mm -hmm. and be present um not only for myself but for my bandmates mm -hmm to be relied upon. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like that was the most important shift that I've made, uh, big big shift that I've made uh, in my personal life that has directly affected my music making mm -hmm. and performance um, is just like getting healthier. Cause like uh, I've felt like garbage like three, two and a half years ago or so. And it was it was it prevented me from doing what I love to do, which is make music and like play drums and scream at the same time, because that can be very taxing. Mm -hmm. um, so I now I can feel like I have more stamina in order to do that. I have more breath power. I just have more energy. I'm not just feeling waxed. I'm not feeling super sleepy. Um, Cause like, I remember I would drink and I'd, I'd be trying to play and it felt like I couldn't grip the drumsticks. Like it was just fatigue. And it was just like, this is only gonna get worse mm -hmm. if I don't do something now. So like, especially with hardcore music and intense music mm -hmm. where you're just putting your all into mm -hmm. it and you're just like exerting a lot of energy. Um, you know, as you get older, you know, that's harder to come by it seems so uh, I'm glad I made the switch when I did because mm -hmm. it I mean it took me a long time to figure th other things out um but like I my bandmates have seen it 
you know, I've made comments on it, like, cause like you're tighter, like you can f keep up and like feel like more of a cohesive unit. There's no dragging, there's like less mistakes or no, and that helps my bandmates play their parts, you know, cause I'm not messing up because I'm the drummer. I'm supposed to be holding the band mm -hmm. afloat and like keeping them going. And you know, if I'm not doing my part, then that, that that's just the harsh reality with metal in general, rock, this type of extreme music is that if you're, you have a drummer that can't hold its own weight, then your band's probably not gonna sound that great. And I'm not trying to toot my horn by, by saying that, but like, it's just kind of the fact of the matter of just like the drums really holds the heartbeat of the band. And if you're not lining up your hits, and keeping up with the rest of the band, then it's gonna suffer. So I decided to stop suffering myself. Mm -hmm. And like, cause I was, I was in a, uh, like a, that place, the compound I mentioned, I was in that place for like a decade and it was like crazy cheap rent, but also it enabled me to, like we had band practice and stuff there and we used to have house shows there. But it, the, the cheap rent and the lifestyle, living with other musicians and everything kind of enabled me to be stuck. Mm -hmm. And there's like so much that I'm doing now that I could have done there that I didn't do. Mm -hmm. Like I would just sit around and play video games and be depressed all the time because I was very much, uh, I drank all the time and I smoked incredible amounts of weed. And I don't do either of those things anymore. And like. I'm a lot happier now because of that. Mm -hmm. um, so I didn't mean to turn this into a whole like sober rant, but it really has impacted my music making on so many different levels and my creativity too. Like being able to like come up, like now I'm just like all these solo projects out of nowhere. Like it took me a year to actually get to the point where I was actually starting to do that because I made music for myself on MTV Music Generator back in the day, it was like a PlayStation game. Mm -hmm. And you could just like, it's very much like Ableton. If you've drawn music on Ableton before, it was just a super basic version of that on PlayStation. And then they made it for the PC and my aunt gave it that, bought me that for Christmas or one year. And I was like, this is sweet. Cause I was very into computers growing up. And so I remember I had this like meticulous thing where I could sit with, this is why I like doing this solo stuff. I can sit with a program uh, and music on a computer and I can just like chip away at it mm -hmm. and just like hours will go by and I'm just like in the lab type. And so like, and this is probably where it comes from. There was a song I made on the PlayStation and I wanted to put it on the computer, but there was no way for me to just move it over because mm -hmm. it was on those little memory cards for the PlayStation. So I had to like look at it and like go over here and redo the same thing that I did on here and then just keep going back and forth. And that song was like 16 minutes long. Wow. It was like a very, very long, it wasn't just like a, like a, like a ditty. It was like a whole long thing. And I spent the time going back and recreating it. And I was so happy that I did that because the computer version, you could save it as WAV files. I still have those songs. If I didn't do that, I would have never had that song would have been gone. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I took the time and I did that. And I still, to this day, still have that music that it's not great, but like, it was like my, my, it's like when you pull out your portfolio from mm -hmm. like high school and you're like, oh my God, this doodle that I did, like, it's so cool. And so it kind of like brings me back to like my grassroots of like making electronic music and also reminds me of how hard I was on myself when I was making that stuff and so embarrassed to like show it to anybody and like self-conscious and I didn't want, I didn't think, and even though people were literally saying you, this sounds great. Mm -hmm. I couldn't believe that. I don't know. I couldn't, I don't know. I just mm -hmm. had this, like lots of childhood trauma and everything, which also kind of comes out through in my music of like dealing with all of those hardships in life from being in a broken home, 
uh, having parents that didn't really get along, having a father that was gone in prison for 19 years, moving around a lot mm -hmm. and not being able to when like establish a good friend base when I moved from Massachusetts to Virginia in 96 and had to start all over with friends. It took me years before I actually met somebody that I'm still friends with this to this day. You know, there's a lot of like time alone. There was a lot of, I spent a lot of time with myself and I escaped that with video games. Mm -hmm. Number one with video games. But also with making the music, it helped me out a lot. So like kind of going back to that is now helping me in my current state of like sobriety and like relearning how to be social with people mm -hmm. without drinking. Cause mm -hmm. like two years ago, I would have been, I would have already had drinks in the car before coming in here to like have this interview. Cause I just couldn't do anything sober when the sun went down. Like I would have to have some sort of edge taken off. Mm -hmm. I just couldn't be, I drank every night. Mm -hmm. And that's just how I was. It was just like, whether I worked or not, cause I grew up working in kitchens and stuff too. I'd go to the store and I would pound uh, Mike's hard lemonade in the alley and then just like show up and be like, all right, let's do this. And just, that's just normal. It mm -hmm. was normal for me. So like, I'm glad like I'm not, reeking of booze right now <laughs> and like forgetting what I just said five minutes ago and repeating myself or something embarrassing so yeah I don't know just um I've had a rough I've had a, a rough go of things but I mean so have a lot of people I know there's a lot of people who've had a lot worse than I have but like I'm just lucky that I've had the hardships that I've had in order to kind of transmute that into some sort of artistic expression mm -hmm. that people enjoy. Thank you so much for sharing. Yeah. I 